Surprise, it's mind pump time. What's up? Welcome back to the best fitness channel on YouTube. All right, here's the giveaway. Maps anywhere. This, by the way, I'm going to make a statement here. I'll back up with science, facts, and studies, all done by me. Maps Anywhere is the best workout program you'll find anywhere that requires no gym access, okay? You don't need dumbbells, barbells, machines. All you need is your body and resistance bands. And we designed this workout program to build muscle and boost your metabolism. This is not your mom's, you know, VHS workout at home uh, workout plan. This is a real workout plan that requires no equipment. And we're giving away for free right now. Here's how you can enter to win that program. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll let you know. And you'll get free access to Maps Anywhere. Now, everyone else, here's what we got going on all month long. Maps Anywhere is 50% off. It's half off right now. Also, our Fit Mom Bundle is 50% off. Now, that's a bundle of programs. So that's got Maps Anywhere, uh, Maps Hit, Maps Anabolic, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, all bundled together, discounted, and now we've taken an additional 50% off. So if you're interested, you want to learn more, you just want to sign up, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code NOVEMBER50. That's November 50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Hey, I got a question for you guys. Mm. Can you remember the most impactful teachers that you had growing up? Or first off, how many really impactful school teachers? teachers? Yeah. Mm. Like oh, how yeah. many really impactful school teachers did you have? And then, okay, so you're saying one. One. All right, what about you, Justin? Yeah, one. I mean, I'm honestly, it's like they're insignificant. Mrs. Yeah. Goble. Shout out to Mrs. Goble. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Hold right. on a second. Hey. That little wink was weird. Check right. cat. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. Was she appropriate? Like, <laughs> no, was, no. She wasn't even a hot teacher, okay. bro. She, oh, my she, God. Now, she, now she's going to hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <laughs> all right. No, all joking aside, what yeah. separated, and, and trust me, there's a direction here. What okay. separated these impactful teachers from all the other, because you obviously had probably 30 teachers or more in your entire life. Yeah. What separated this one teacher from the others? The the irony of mine was uh, it was a subject that I, I don't think I'm very good at, but she helped build self-belief in me. So that was the big thing, right? So, and I've shared a little bit about it on the show where it was English, right? So, and you guys know, like, I just, I can't put a full sentence together if my life depended <laughs> on it. I have, t I'm gr grammatically challenged, right? So writing stuff, but yet I found myself in advanced English. Isn't that great? Yeah, and it's because of her though, because she instilled that in me, right? Like even though she, I, my papers would come back chalked with red, right? Because I, you know, all the grammatical errors all the time. But what she always encouraged me about, and said I was really good at, was was putting my thoughts on paper. Like I, I, I had the ability to take whatever we were reading or learning, and then put it on paper. The the way uh, the structure of it was awful. But my thoughts were powerful, yeah. and she made me, or she made me feel that they were powerful, and that I was really good at that. And so it inspired me to work at that and get better at writing. And still to, the, to this day, Justin may remember some of this, uh, but I actually used to write emails to like the VPs and and presidents of our company when we worked for 24 Hour Fitness for other managers mm -hmm. because I had a really good I had the ability to take like okay this is what your desired outcome is right this is like w how you need to say this uh then they would have to go edit it because the the grammar would be all messed up but the the what the delivery of what I was trying to convey I was really good at that all came from her yeah well the mm. the truth is you are a good communicator um so she was so, and what you said was really interesting is she gave you a sense of self-belief, right? which is a, a big deal. Justin, what about for you? Um, yeah, I don't really have like a specific, I think for me, it was mainly like, um, he was a really dumb kid. Yeah. I was just dumb <laughs> in general. The only one with a degree. Yeah. I, I actually got more impact from my coaches uh, growing up wow. for the most part. Um, and that was just mainly a mindset thing for me. Like for school, for me, uh, I got interested in certain subjects. And so it was very much like anatomy, physiology, like biomechanics, like, you know, the sciences, like those were the things that stimulated me. So I did have one impactful uh, professor that uh, was teaching chemistry and I hated chemistry because anything where I had to like memorize everything, like I was terrible at like memorizing like formulas and like putting all, but he would make it uh, so interesting to where it, it would show 
like actual experiments and make it fun and blow stuff up. And, you know, it was just like, whoa, like it could be, it could be cool. And like, there's, it, it translates to real things. It's not just like I'm living in this textbook and, and trying to regurgitate whatever it was that I just read. It was like actionable. Uh, so that was, that was probably, you know, the, the, the person that I can think of is we called him boomer, uh, <laughs> because he just blew everything up. Yeah. So. You know, you know, it's funny. Did you have, did you sell? I did. And I, it's like one, one or two, right. Yeah, that I can one, think huh? of. And you know, th the reason why I'm talking about this is I was talking, uh, with someone about good trainers and coaches and how really what a good trainer is at the end of the day. And people might not realize this, but they're really good teachers because, the goal of a trainer isn't just to take you through a workout. Like it would be like a teacher just taking you through the exercises of your arithmetic or of your writing. But the difference between that kind of a teacher, which is a majority of teachers, and the great ones, is they embolden you, they empower you to do it yourself. And a really good trainer has the that that's the goal, right? Is to get that that client to the point where yes, they come and do what you say, and that's what clients think that they're hiring you for. But when you do a really good job, you empower them so that this is something that they do on their own. They develop that relationship with exercise that lasts a lifetime. So that's really what it's all about is can I create that for this person? Not just tell them what to do, take them through a workout when they show up, right? but be like that teacher. Because, and the reason why I brought that up is here we are grown men, you know, we're all, you know, all, either almost 40 or in our early 40s. And we still can think back to that one or two teachers that had that impact. That's how big of a deal it was. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it changes the complete trajectory that my life probably went on from that point on. Like up until that point, that was something I was probably insecure, scared about, wouldn't do. And then it ends up becoming potentially a strength of mine, which is, I think, crazy. And that a coach has that ability to do that, to find that in somebody and go like, this it may be a weakness right now, but inspire them to to find the the strength within that right and change how that person's going to be forever. Yeah. Some people are blessed and they have I I mean I've heard people tell stories about yeah. several teachers. Oh, this teacher and that yeah. teacher. It's like I, I know not I'm almost jealous cuz even my brother like he became a teacher because he had such a, a great impactful teacher that uh really like kind of took him under his wing and and uh you know fostered that whole uh desire to learn more and 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 do what he does and so like i just didn't have that dude like I, I i was always just like sort of in class getting through watching the clock and then trying to you know make people laugh i was just like i was so bored you know i wasn't gonna bring this up but this conversation is is got me thinking about the post that i just did the other day um i reposted i don't know if you guys saw the tweet that zuby put out and i did a poll to ask people and this this kind of is on the same lines of what we're talking about right now and the, the, the tweet he did said, I'm fairly convinced that if you leveled the playing field and gave everybody $25,000 to start, that within five years, most of the people who are currently rich would be rich again, and those who are currently broke would be broke again. Yeah. And <clears throat> I got a lot of DMs of people that disagreed, right? That think that if, you know, if part of why a lot of people are broke is because they didn't have the teachers and the financial literacy or education. And if they had that, then they too wouldn't. And I said, well, I don't know if I fully agree with that because I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, now, do I think if my parents would have given me that, would I got to a certain place earlier than what I am now? Possibly. But then I could also make the argument too that I value it more because I didn't have it. And mm -hmm. it was later in life when I did finally seek it out myself. And so when I got that information, I put it to practice versus if it was just, you know, your parents, are, that's one of my fears as a, as a dad now is because I'm already strong. Like I've already got the books for Max when yeah, he's like right. five and then nine. Like I've already thought that out of like, I want to teach him, you know, the cash flow game. And like, I'm going to teach him all these things, you know, but I always, the fear in the back of my mind always is, you know, if I indoctrine him with all this, this financial literacy early on, will it just become like a second thought well, to him and not a big deal between that. And also when we had Joe Decina on and he's bringing up like trying to create 
uh, adversity and create these challenges. Uh, so there's struggle, right? And there's it, it, to be able to present that in a way where uh, you know it's going to help to grow and foster this you know sort of work ethic and, and mm. overcoming you know mindset versus like being uh, given everything at, at your disposal and then uh, you know not necessarily uh, growing and developing the way we want our kids to. It's an interesting debate. I feel like I could argue it either way. Well, I mean, where, the, where do you stand on it, it? It's a classic argument of nature versus nurture. Now, there's a couple things, though. First, is that learning is more than just knowing the steps, right? So if you're taking a person and you want to teach them the steps to eating right and exercising so they could take a test and write them down, that's one thing. If you want to teach them so that they live it for the rest of their life, that's a completely different thing. That means they have to go through and understand the skill and how to apply it and the value and how to, you know, the discipline and how to deal with not being motivated and all that stuff. That's a completely different thing. And then the second part is this is a classic nature versus nurture thing. For example, would LeBron James be good at basketball if he never practiced or trained basketball? I would argue yes, but he would not be as good as he is now. He would be great. Right? Yes. Would I be a better basketball player if I practiced basketball since I was a kid? Yes. Will I ever be as good as LeBron James is now? No, right? So it's a nature versus nurture. So I think you have your potential. Well, what about in something like this, where we're like, like Zuby's tweet, like re related to I agree financial with that. success? I do. I agree with that because a lot of people think the reason why they're not successful is they didn't have money to begin with. Mm -hmm. Or lack the opportunity. Right. But I, I, I think uh, a lot of that has to do with this. Look, here's the deal. I grew up. I was raised by poor immigrants with no education. They started with no money. But I'll, I will say I learned a lot of skills from my parents in terms of working hard, saving money, and not going into debt. I learned very basic financial skills from them. I didn't learn investments and stuff like that because they never had the money to do that. And that's the stuff that people were debating me is just like, you know, if you knew what to invest in when you were young. I mean, I no, I that's didn't. The, that's, the, that's the second part. Right. The first part is, do you know how to work, live within your means, mm -hmm. and not go into debt? Most people don't know that. It's like this. It's like, do you know how to not eat enough, not overeat, and do you know how to count your macros? Very basic. And most people don't know that when it comes well, to- And that's a, well, the, the, the Millionaire Next Door that covers that. that the, the number one thing that all millionaires had in common is the ability to live- They ever, There's yes. like tons of millionaires in all different, app, like all different ways they made their millions- but the one thing they all had in common was the ability to live significantly below their what their means, right? Totally. What they need. Yeah, because so. if even if you knew that strategically, you knew the how to invest. Like, uh, like you, you went to go invest, and you, you made all the right decisions with that. Like, and it it just was something that was an opportunity given to you, but you didn't go through the steps of, of valuing money and like learning to earn it, you know, in a certain degree and then make those investments. You may just make, you know, a wild investment and then lose it all uh, because like you think that same playbook's going to apply. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I know somebody personally who passed away and I know them personally. They earned, they were big earners in most of their working career. Okay. They were really, really good at what they did made lots of money, died, left their family with debt because they lived at the they they lived above their means. Then I know people who, you know, blue collar workers. They didn't make a ton of money, but they lived a particular way. They lived below their means. They didn't go into debt and they were able to retire early and have a nice nest egg to take care of themselves. So that's rule number 1. And I tell you what, I know people who struggle with money who are adults and I know them personally. And you look at their spending habits, and it's like they spend money on like. And I know this sounds silly, but add it up: Starbucks all the time, cigarettes, going out to eat, five million streaming services. Oh, it's Christmas time. Mm -hmm. We're gonna spend two hundred and fifty dollars on our kids for their presents, and we're gonna, you know, oh, oh, I, I, th I have enough money to afford this car payment. So rather than looking at the cost of the car, they go squeeze how much they can make a car payment, and they constantly are pushing it. And it's like, well, that's why. You're always living that way. Yeah. So that's the, it's not the investment aspect. Uh, yeah, that no. might take you to like a whole nother level. Yeah. But if I think if you, and this is a, is a fact, look at the average American's debt. It's insane. Well, nor is it necessarily the opportunity either. I, I actually think to bring it back full circle to how this conversation started, the teacher has a lot to do with this. Like mm -hmm. you could have a, a parent who can teach you about finances that may not be wealthy and you have a lot of success that way. Yeah. So I think that 
actually can have more of an impact than not like or have a parent that doesn't at all and you grew up in in a bad situation and then you just fall in the same pattern so i think uh, back to the whole coaching point how impactful a good coach and teacher can be a good coach or teacher could teach a lot of this stuff and i know we're, we've moved over to to money and finances, but it's it's the same thing, yeah. right? Well, there's those studies on, um, my favorite ones are the studies on lottery winners, mm -hmm. where they'll follow lottery winners, and the majority of them, if, if, you're, if they start out in financial distress, and then they win you know, $10 million, $20 million, I forgot what the timeline was, it was something like seven years later, they're usually back to where they were before. After winning, yeah, I think it's even faster than that. Millions yeah. of dollars, yeah. Which just you know, and again, it's like this. It's the here's here. Because you change behaviors, now, just and, like with yeah. fitness. Yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use this analogy because our audience is fitness minded, and I know if, by saying that people are like that's bullshit. If I won ten million or what? Okay, here's a different one. If I could snap my fingers and make all Americans fit and lean right now, how long before they got back to their current level of unhealthiness? It would happen. They wouldn't maintain it, right? Yeah. Because this, they didn't have the skills to continue uh, doing that, right? So it's it's just, you know, it's one of those things that's very challenging. 70% of people who win a lottery or receive a large windfall go bankrupt within a few years. Yeah, it's, it's a majority. Wow. Yeah, never learned how to, you know, manage it properly. Well, you didn't build, you By didn't the build, way, what you do didn't you build a good favorite. It's just like what you said. It's yes. okay, a better example that's like just like this is somebody who goes and gets 30 pounds of fat liposucked out of their body. Yep. Like that's a better example of like the lottery example. Like that's literally like winning the fat loss lottery. Or bariatric surgery. That's what I mean, right? Yeah. So you do something that dramatically just takes the weight off over in a course of a, a month or two and you got you got to where you, you want to be. You didn't learn with, anything. It's you the same analogy with like going Mount Everest and getting dropped off by a helicopter. Right. right. It's like, the journey. Cool, you made it. But did you learn anything? No. Yeah. You now, now, anything. now take it a step further. What do, who, what do kids learn in school about... Uh, financial literacy and skills. What did you guys learn in school? Nothing. Zero. Not a damn thing. I didn't. They didn't teach us debt, credit cards, loans. They didn't teach us anything they about teach money. They teach you how whatsoever. to become a professor. They don't want you to know anything about money, I think. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, I have a, a similar belief that they just want you to be another cog, you know, you know, and just get into the system and just, you know, work and make a certain amount of money, pay your taxes. I mean, that's where it's at. Yeah, so. and they all, of course, they don't teach you about really how to maintain your health either. It's like some nope. of the most important things that you could possibly learn. I mean, I had to learn, you know, I'll just, me too, this is my personal story here. What I learned from my parents were very basic skills, again, because my parents didn't have a high education and were poor. And they learned, they, what they taught me was don't spend a lot of money, save, and don't go into debt, which are the basic skills. And it did take me far. But as a young, I mean, I was 19, 20, managing these big gyms. I mean, you're talking 1998, right? I was making well into six figures as a kid, living with my parents. So I was saving tons of money. I did not learn anything about investments because my parents didn't understand investments. Yeah, yeah. Now, had I learned that, oh my God, I would have gone to the next level. But the basic skills definitely took me you know, a certain direction. You know what I learned? I learned to stop telling people to buy stocks and they're not buying it myself. Oh, bro. <laughs> that fucking keeps happening to me. Dude, <laughs> Dude great advice, Adam. Bro, so, yeah, I've been killing I'm so it. so tired of hearing about stocks. I don't even want it. Where's, where's the Trump one at now? Well, too? the Trump one's now down because oh, I'm sure a lot of people sold. Thank God. But it's at 68. I yeah, mean, when still, we talked about it, it was like 20. Yeah. So. I love that. And it, was there even an example of it or it was just people just buying on the speculation of what it was going to become? Oh, bro. It's just because the news. Yeah. It's one of those news stocks, right? Yeah. My favorite is still HubSpot. Yeah, no. You know what HubSpot's at now? I don't want to know. No, I no, it's good, Doug. No, I mean, no, Adam, we need yeah. to know. We need to talk about this. Bro, it's at 800 <laughs> It was 87, bro. Wow. 800 dollars. Okay. But that's a company that's gonna just Yeah. I mean, they're 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 leading the way. You know what else? Another one too. Again, I don't have stock in them is Tesla. Yeah. Tesla. That one blows me away. Yeah, because of how crazy. Well, Hertz just ordered a hundred thousand uh, cars. They signed a contract for a hundred thousand. The Hertz is gonna move their whole their fleet into all Teslas, pretty much all Teslas. Wow. That's you know, hundred thousand cars. That I think is, is probably. I did not a big, see that coming. Big bulk of that. Yeah, and then uh, Morgan Stanley came out and said I'm that for your Hertz that joke. Tesla will go all the way. <laughs> that really hurts. Over yeah. twelve hundred, I think, is what they're predicting, and they're like at nine hundred something right now. Doug, maybe you can check me. I think I think Tesla's at nine nine something, and that and Morgan Stanley came out that it's there for sure till twelve. Wow, I mean, that's a big order. 
And if other rental companies follow suit, yeah. oh boy, no, that'll be massive. No, abs- absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of things that hurt, uh, funny story. So I got to, I got to, I got to tell this story because it's just hilarious. So last night, so you guys know the night before, I came into work and wow, it's at a thousand right now. Tesla. Wow. So you guys know the the other, I came into work the other day and I look like the Walking Dead because our power went out because of the storm. Yeah, no yeah. sleep for you. And we have uh, my son who always challenge, sleep is always challenging for him. He, we have sound machines that are on, mm-hmm. and now he's used to that. I didn't even think of this because he's now you been didn't raised. Use your phone? Well, bro, hold on. So okay. he's raised. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Just fucked up your story. Well, no, no, I'll tell you. He's raised with sound machines now, right? Yeah. yeah. So now without the sound machine, kid can't sleep. Yeah. Okay. Power goes out. Sound machines don't work. The reason why I can't use my phone or our phones is because we we couldn't charge our phones. So our phones were at half power Mm. and I needed it to wake Mm. up the next day because we lost. So anyway, from basically 2 a.m. and on and off, no sleep. So I came in here just totally dead. Mm -hmm. So last night- uh, you know, I told Jessica, like, we need to go to bed hella early. She was obviously tired too. So she's like, I'll go to bed like pretty much when he does. And then hopefully I'll fall asleep. So anyway, we go upstairs. She goes to bed 730, goes to sleep. And I'm like, you know what? I'm still kind of wired. Let me go downstairs and I'll come back up and, and when I'm tired. So about 45 minutes later, so 815 ish, I walk upstairs. This is a funny story. This is a husband and wife story, right? I get into bed. I sneak in real quiet and I'm like, oh man. <laughs> My stomach, god damn it! And you ever have like a just you just drop heat in in the under the covers? Oh yeah, with a, your, okay. a Dutch oven. Oh yeah. bro, but it's but safe. It's just air, but it's extra hot. Oh I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sharing the story, but it's just hilarious because the, the sheets are down, so I'm like it's safe if nobody moves. Right. Of course she turns over, and then I'm, I'm like, please God, please don't hit. And sure enough, I hear her turn over, and she just all of a sudden. Motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, Just I'm a, sorry, you're honey. Not, you're Brown not a good husband, stream. and you don't you don't roll the uh, opposite direction, then let it creep out the back, bro. Yeah, oh, it doesn't a, matter. That's a good husband. You gotta have right little there. escape hatches. Dude. Yeah, dude. you gotta <laughs> you gotta roll the opposite that. direction, yeah. and you gotta you gotta let it creep out the back. It doesn't you know? matter, dude. and a little bit at a time, because if you go all of it at once. <laughs> The aroma will be too strong. Bro, in the room, so you it, was, it. it was bad. I was. I felt so bad for her. I just hear. I just yeah, hear yeah. her wake up. Motherfucker! Like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. About you should yeah, heard what, You should heard what happened to Katrina just the other day. So Katrina goes in and gets Max. It's like I don't know. I think it's like four o'clock in the morning. This is uh, when we were up at Truckee. And she goes and gets Max. He's, you know, she's like half, it's like four in the morning and he wakes up. And when he does that, sometimes if it's like after four, she'll go get him and she'll put him in the bed with her yeah. and let him sleep the rest of the way. So she goes and it's all she keeps it all dark so she doesn't wake up, turn the lights on. She scoops him up, puts him in the bed, crawl, lays down, and she's laying there. And right now, Mozzie's hurt, like uh, his I don't know if it's arthritis or what. And um, we didn't, she didn't take him out that night. So and she was all worried, like because he's like because he can't get up and down the stairs. And she tells me I couldn't walk him late at night. I had Max and couldn't figure out how to do it by myself. And so I just you know cross my fingers that he doesn't go in the house. Well, all of a sudden she smells shit like oh, really no. strong. And she's like, oh my God, she just, it's 4 30 in the morning now. I've scooped Max up in here. So she gets up and she's like using her phone to look on the carpet and stuff like that. And she's like, she doesn't see anything. She's like, what the hell? She's like, I smell so strong, like, like, like poop. And so she turns her eye off, crawls back in bed again, like smells really bad. She's like, oh, maybe Max is, you know, had a, had a poopy diaper. She, she goes to check his poopy diaper and he is, covered in shit oh so no. he shit the bed and and like i mean it just like explode one of those oh, explosions no, yeah. and she actually picked him up and brought him into our bed all <laughs> like that and then now it's like all over her she doesn't know till she turns the lights oh, on no. and she's like she's covered in shit bro and she, <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah, it five o'clock smell in the morning good still. oh yeah. dude poor she, kid oh i know she got yeah. up and just you know poor obviously mom. stripped the bed and then just did a bath with him and the stuff two, like, that's the two worst things in the oh, middle yeah. night is that as a blowout or throw up have you had yeah. that yet where your yeah. kid's like like uh, I'm I, th- I threw up and you're like oh He's god just like all over the wall you don't even know what to do you're like uh, get the garbage bat I don't know yeah. what do we do is there a hose well yeah, you remember when tub. when Max was little you remember that we went through that phase where he was learning to do that to make to her, get her attention yeah smart kid we would watch him on the yeah. camera and he would this was he hasn't done this in a long time but he used to do this when he was like one where he would be looking at the camera 
Yeah, <laughs> sticky is. Look at the camera. Oh yeah, bro. He knows oh, where the camera's man. at, and he knows that we can. Because I used to talk That's to the camera, level. so yeah. he would look at the camera like after he like, cried for a little you, bit. Huh? Yeah, and then he huh? and he'd look up there. And, Dude, so <laughs> it's so oh. easy. my my son he he's found his screaming voice apparently, and so he just randomly screams just loud at the top of ah ah. Now Jessica <laughs> is sensitive to sound, so she's the kind of person that she can only tolerate so much sound. Now, funny considering she married me, right? She she needs it <laughs> quiet or whatever, and he's screaming, and she's like, <laughs> and she'll text me. She's like, I'm trying to maintain because I don't want him to know. Mm -hmm. That it's really bothering me. Yeah, yeah. Because then he'll continue doing it. So she's like, I'm hoping this is a phase that'll pass. <laughs> but dude, I come home and he's playing and just screaming. Yeah. He's going over there. He's just screaming. Just screaming. Yeah, yeah. Just because it's his favorite thing uh. to do now. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, honey, I'm sorry he took my genetics. You got a loud ass husband and oh, kid now. Yeah. My bad. Speak, so I wasn't going to bring it because I was going to try and like keep it for like a cool, like, well, actually, I don't even know if it'd be a good Butcher Box commercial or not, but it was like this moment we're at the table and uh i was talking to everett and, and ethan and they had been getting into youtube videos and memes and things. they love like watching all these memes and stuff uh and there's this one um youtuber that's this vegan lady who's just you know really like aggressively uh angry you know and so they're like why is she so angry dad and they're asking me all these questions you know about veganism i'm trying to like you know under like have them understand like and be a little more empathetic like okay well you know the, like she's considering like the way that these some of these farms are set up is like you know this is like you know just horrendous like yeah. it's, like they're mistreating these animals they're putting them in these cages and like you know shoving all these like antibiotics in them and you know it's just like inhumane the way that you know some of these farms are set up and then i had to try and explain then uh basically uh you know like other ways of, of practices, like, you know, like a grass fed, grass finish and like having like free rain, all this stuff actually ended up turning into a commercial. I started talking to them and this is why we have butcher box. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they're humanely like treated Ted, we're already and blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then this is where it got me. Cause this is where I was like, okay, this is my son. But also I had to have another conversation after this. He's just like, well, dad, I mean, shouldn't it be like this. Like you should just say that, you know, all the cows are racist. What? That's why that we way kill we kill them and people are happy. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Dude, like it's, but I'm like, okay. It's so wild how their brains so, turn at that age. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is the point where you know that that yeah. term has been watered yeah. down. We and, only and kill, we only kill bad cows. Overused. And so I was just like, this term has been way overused. And this is a real thing. That's, that's an evil thing. And like, here's why and all this kind of stuff. But like, you know, you can just see how just throwing these terms out there so willy nilly about yeah. every little thing. Like this is what happens, dude. They, yeah. Now it's not like respected for what it really is. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, that's that's totally true. Well, yeah. speaking of like health and stuff like that, so I got two messages from uh, some of our listeners. One of them was very interesting. So you guys remember when I brought up the supplement Agmatine? Yeah. You guys remember yeah. that? Okay. One of the one of the purported benefits of Agmatine is to help with opiate withdrawal. And I, I mentioned that in the, on the show. Well, somebody messaged me and says, he goes, Sal, he goes, that was a godsend. He goes, I've been trying to come off of opiates because he's, he's got an opiate problem where he takes, you know, like painkillers or whatever. He says that Agmentine has helped tremendously. So does it, does it, um, like, uh, uh, Kratom does, does it pair with the opiate receptors? Is that what, no, uh, see, what but, helps it? How does it help? So it? the thing with Kratom is then you'll go on withdrawals when you go off that. Too. Right. Right. Cause I mean, that's the downfall of Kratom is that. No, mean, no. Agmentine is not like that. It, oh. For whatever reason, the way that it works with the neurotransmitters is it just helps with the withdrawal. So when people go off opiates, they'll take Agmentine and apparently according to the studies, the withdrawal is much lower. And so this guy messaged me and is like, man, I feel like this is like a godsend. Huh. This was a big, and and it's not an opiate and it doesn't act on the opiate receptor. So interesting, very interesting. And then I got another message about uh, one of our sponsors, Organifi. So, you know, the, the products that we use in here most often are like the green juice, the pure and the protein. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll throw in the red juice here, here and there once in a while. But they have a lot of products, and there's a lot of stuff that I've never used. I, I see the ingredients, and it looks really interesting, but I've never used. Well, anyway, somebody messaged me and said that they were using their liver reset product. Mm. So they have a, a, a supplement with compounds that help the liver 
you know, with its health, like artichoke, and it's got dandelion root and milk thistle. Well, anyway, they said that their liver enzymes were always kind of an issue. They started mm. taking it, and they noticed a dramatic improvement, and their energy oh, has gone wow. up a, a lot as well. Mm. Now, the ingredients in the liver reset have been shown in studies to have beneficial effect on the liver. So it's not, you know, there's there's proven benefits. But they were mentioning how it's really improved uh, their quality of life yeah. from taking. Well, so it's cool to hear about. That's interesting, yeah, because that was one of my markers when we were doing that whole life insurance thing. Oh, like, yeah. I was like, I wish I would have better numbers. I should have, like, uh, considered that before. Are you done with that? Are you, what, so what happened? So after yeah, that so happened, with... you were uh, the most unhealthy out of all of no. us. <laughs> that's <laughs> not accurate kidding. at all. <laughs> no, so, I mean, yeah. so Doug explained this to me how this, because I was confused by this, too, like how this, there's, like, a, a, a we did all we all did our stuff our blood work for our life insurance and stuff like yeah. that and there's they there's grading scales like you're the insurance guy explain to me how that works and what's good what's bad um how much of a difference there's, that can make on your payment isn't there like super preferred or something like that yeah so there's like super preferred preferred is, standard is that the super preferred the highest yes what's the lowest well there's rated policies so you can have like a b c table d type ratings so okay. for example if somebody's had cancer like seven years ago, they may be able to get a policy, but it's rated like table C or something like so that. So your, your price is way more. So what they do is they add, uh, basically the cost of insurance goes up. There's something called a flat extra mm -hmm. where you add extra premium. And of course, the higher the rating, the lower the cost of insurance per thousand dollars. You know, I know what's interesting about this. So if you read about markers per, that predict your mortality, the insurance companies actually do a damn good job in comparison to other you know ways of more of, of seeing someone's potential mortality over a period of time really they have to yeah right i was gonna say it's they, it's, it's money in they, or money out they spend so much money on research and figuring out because it's competitive market right you're gonna go you're gonna compete compare sorry four different life insurance companies and they want to give you the best price, but they also have to profit. Otherwise, they're not going to have a business. <clears throat> so they are really good at figuring out how much you can pay versus what your mortality risk is and then what their profits are going to look like. Right. That's why they do the big physical. They do all the tests. And then – so when they say you're preferred, super preferred or whatever, <laughs> like if you go and – if you ever want to know like your risk of mortality – Yeah. Go try to get life insurance. They're actually really good. I was going to say, that's like the real Deadpool, right? Yes. You get all the insurance companies like have your name out there. Like, mm, I don't know. Like, yeah, I'll give them another 10 years. It, they have to <laughs> because that's how they make their, their money. Because if they're wrong, then they'll lose money or they'll get outcompeted by a company that does a better job. With now, Doug, you did numbers. this stuff. So did, are there certain ones that you know that like are really major? Obviously, I think smoking is a big one. I know you've said that before. Like, Yeah, so they ask all types of questions regarding like health things such as smoking, uh, you know, obviously your medical history such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease. Yeah. But there's also other risks such as do you skydive? Do right. you go spelunking you know these yeah. are like Mobile crazy spelunker. questions do you ride a motorcycle uh they ask yeah. Yeah. yeah and so they actually have what's called mortality tables and these are like tables that say okay based on these risk factors and your current age this is how long we anticipate you're going to live and in order for our company to make a profit we need to charge this much for insurance yeah. so say you want to do a tw uh, say a 10 or 15 year term policy for a million dollars that's very inexpensive if, say, you're 35 or 40 years old uh, for annual, but the company's on the line for a million dollars from day one. So they want to make sure that you're going to at least make it past that 10 to 15 year mark on that uh, policy. Yeah, because so they, yeah, they don't want to pay out on a yeah. term policy. In fact, they don't pay out on over like 95 or 97 percent of wow. term policies. Mm -hmm. Those are their cash cow uh, there. So those mortality tables definitely tell them, okay, where where's this person at? How much should we charge them? And uh, they're they're in it for the profit, of course. And and something as simple as as Justin's liver enzymes being a little bit off is enough to knock him down a whole category, or is it a lot of was it because of his STDs and stuff in there that <laughs> it was the crabs? But I told him it was only there for they're like friendly a day. crabs, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I mean, no, really though. I mean, was is that enough to knock him down a whole category? Yeah. So they're looking at like the elevated liver enzymes, and they're saying, okay, this guy has something going on with his health, even though it's probably related to his exercise. Yeah, his exercise. Uh, but but they're saying. 
saying this is a risk factor. And because of this, we're going to use our discretion mm. and give him a lower rating. Yeah. But it, but you can, if you go back and say, okay, I noticed my CK levels are a little elevated, but I do resistance training six days a week. And then they look at everything else. Then they'll say, you're right. Because they have to consider certain things. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. When you exercise and you tear muscle down and all that kind of stuff, and you have more muscle mass, your numbers will be a little different than the average person's. And if they don't know that, they're going to think that you're, then those numbers look bad compared to the average you person. You know, the irony yeah. of that is I, so I'm working out the least out of all of us right now. And my, my levels came back, my blood work came back the best. But in the past, when I did it for like my hormone therapy, my levels were, and I was consistently training yeah. like almost every day, they were off a little bit. So it's kind of, it's kind of like it's this. a little misleading. Yeah, because I mean, I technically I just, uh, you know, three months ago or whatever it was when I did my blood work for my uh, HRT, I, w I would consider myself healthier then than right. I am now just because I was exercising even more then. But the irony is that it threw my blood work off a little bit compared to well, right And then now. All, what does this say about the, um, the percentage of people that exercise regularly that these life insurance companies work with, right? Most of the people that they work with are just like most people. They don't exercise regularly or definitely not with any intensity. Right. That's why uh, body mass index, you know, that's why they'll uh, consider your weight. Yeah. I mean, if they don't know that we lift weights and work out and they just no. look at our weight, they'll you'll like, get you'll get something in the mail from Kaiser for <laughs> yeah, uh, your obese. obesity clinic that <laughs> wants to put you on 1500 calories. I was like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> like, like, you know, hit me while I'm down, you know, like, a couple of like, shots so, of the nuts. That's you know, so like, great. Uh, like, bro, <laughs> that's so I already great. get hammered at work about my fatness. <laughs> you know, now Kaiser's <laughs> coming with the side shot. <laughs> oh, you know what, Justin? I wanted to bring <laughs> this up to you, dude. Uh, Dune. Oh, bro. Oh, please Can't, don't share too much. Come okay, on. There's come no, on. We're not going to spoil like, it. There's no spoiler. confirmation why. It was amazing, right? Doug, have you watched it yet? I haven't. Okay. I'm waiting for that uh, one. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. Best, okay, so. yeah. One of the best movies yeah. I think I've ever I'm seen. I'm going to bring your credibility back up with yeah. your uh, recommendations. It, it's one goal. of the best movies I've ever seen. It is. Easily. It is. I, you, guys, best you guys compare it to time. Matrix. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know why it was so good? Because, first off, the way it depicted the future... I think it did it in a way. Sometimes when they, when when directors or whatever. So you writers, mean like it's good because like I feel it, Player One hit it out the park with something like that. It was so good. It's like very believable. Yes, this is where we could. But be. remember, Dune is set in the year ten thousand. Okay, so it's so far in the future. Mm -hmm. Like play, Ready Player One is like you could be believe that happening in the next fifty years, right? Yeah. The year ten thousand, you're trying to create a future that's you know eight you know eight thousand years from now, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like that's crazy. But what they did that was really interesting is the way that they incorporated culture with technology and, and they explain technology. the technology. So yeah. This is something that you're going to find in a lot of movies that they don't take the time to really describe like why it's relevant, why it's relevant. I'm wearing this suit and uh, you know, all the intricacies with that suit. And like, so they, they took the time to explain their way through each one of these like tech items. And it was like, I just I, I picked up on that the second time I watched because I already watched it twice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the other thing is like, you know, this author, instead of going in the direction of like all tech, like advancements, yeah. was like more of the human advancements. Yes. Like, so say that like, you know, way in the future, we figure out like telekinesis, we figure out like psychic abilities, we figure out like all these different ways of like improving our uh, evolvement of humanity. Like, where does that lead? Like, so it's just a different idea that I think is really cool. But yeah. also you do see like really cool spaceships yeah. and like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the scale. The, I scales love the scale is of massive. And I love the the story. So the the my other critique, because I'm a big sci-fi fan, and one of my big critiques with sci-fi is they focus too much on the imagery and not on the story. Or mm -hmm. the or the the tech is like ridiculous or like it's uh, like they'll put tech up for the sake of it. Like for example, Minority Report. There's some cool stuff in it, right? But then they show these big, m massive, awkward computer, and just to show that you can move your hands. No, nobody would have a computer that I have to stand up and move like crazy to use just to make it look cool. So I, when I see it, I go, they went overboard with that, right? Mm -hmm. This doesn't do that. The scale is incredible, and the story is really good. Yeah, and it's so it's, it's one very of those believable. Yes, dude, it's going to be epic, bro. It's an epic film. Speaking of good stories, I was we so uh, just a couple nights ago. I'm trying to catch up to you guys. I think now. Are you watching you yet? 
Yes. You are. How Bro, far How far are you? Before you say anything, where are you at? No, I'm on episode nine, and okay. I'm already having weird dreams because of this freak. Yeah, I had a dream the I'm other like night. like four or five in. Dude, okay, I, so I had a dream that Jessica and I murdered someone and buried them in the woods, and I woke up, and I was like, what <laughs> I the you fuck? Need to, yeah, yeah. I got to not I had, watch I had, had a weird, I had weird dreams like that, too. So it's uh, so anyways, uh, I'm, I think I'm on four or five now, and I think Justin started to bring this up, but we just kind of like went over it really quick. That I was surprised. So we're- Yeah, it's surprising you guys did that. Yeah, <laughs> so, 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 I did. I had to, I had to <laughs> apologize. Yeah. I had to apologize him. This happens to Justin, by the way, sometimes. Sometimes he brings up like really cool stuff and just because maybe Sal or I have well, read I just on don't it. sell it with enough Yeah, you got to sell better. Okay, that's good. Yeah, take yeah, some ownership I'll, here. I'll take ownership Sell your stories better, okay? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah, so, or you guys are just dicks. One so <laughs> we're we're watching, right? And uh, we're down we're downstairs. Max is asleep. We're watching our we're watching a couple episodes of you. Katrina's on the computer and she's she's working at the same time, like kind of half watching. And uh, you know, I'm watching it and I'm like, Oh, get the fuck out of here. And I'm like kind of barking at the TV. Yeah. And she's like, what? I'm like, are you not seeing what they're doing right now with measles? I'm like, <laughs> look how they're trying to draw this parallel yeah. with uh-huh. spreading measles right now. This The same thing that we're going through right now. And she's like, no. She goes, oh my God, that's so funny because yeah. I literally was just, she's like responding to emails with work and stuff. She's all, I, we got this email from a fan and I wasn't even going to waste my time sending it to you guys, but maybe you want to see it now. And I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, it's someone's watching you and they, they've they heard us talk about it on it and they want us to, to talk about this point of like how they're like targeting anti-vaxxers and like making it a yeah. big deal and they yeah, do this parallel. Yeah, programmed with, in for sure. You know oh, dude, it just out of nowhere, all of a sudden it took this kind of turn it's I'm relevant. Like, that That's was why. so written in yeah. like be- it's because it's relevant it for relevant. the times yeah you know what's annoying about that whole conversation that it, 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 this is the truth now not all vaccines are the same no. I, I, I you're not either anti-vax or pro all vax if you're a wise person mm-hmm. you you look at them all individually measles vaccines are extremely successful you get one you have lifetime immunity yep comparing that to other vaccines and saying that they're all the same is silly. It just yeah. really is. So yeah. if somebody's doing that, you're an idiot. They're, they're mm-hmm. not all the same. It's like saying all antibiotics are the same or all vitamins are the same or all whatever. It's not that way. But I mean, it, you could see how it like emboldens, uh, yes. you know, that sort of tribal response of like, yeah, all these people don't get vaccines. They're fucking killing people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's exactly why they threw that in there. And, and, you know, and I get it too. It's 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 good writing in, in that they're they're you know this is the climate right now, and so they're sort of like presenting that as like how somebody would actually think about yeah. what's going on. Right well, it now. also yeah, it shows how like movies have a lot of you know their narrative can really shift the way people collectively think. Yes, because you got to think there's a big portion of people that aren't doing their own homework research. They hear a little bit of stuff in the news, but then they're they're binging their favorite show, well, right. and so a lot of that just kind of it's. Subconsciously solidifies some of their beliefs the, the, without really knowing it's, everything. It's, it's all kinda... it's all corporate media. Okay, like for example, did you guys know that if you do a military movie and you depict the U.S. military in a good way, that you can actually get money from the U.S. government to support your film? Did you guys know that? I didn't know. Okay, that. I mean so, that's probably not the case anymore. But yeah, no, no, this is well. It, <laughs> Let's it, be honest. My point is that there's a narrative, and it's there's it's corporate owned. I'll give you guys another. Here's a great example. So okay, I, based off of that theory, do you think that a show like you, you know, has an opportunity? So they they obviously wrote that script during this whole time, right? In the last right. year or two, right? And to, in order to build that into the and that probably if the writer wrote this story. I doubt exactly was written that way, but they probably found a way to insert that into the storyline, right? And My, then, and does do you it, based off what you're saying? Do you think someone like Netflix yep. pays them more money to do that? Not pays more or, money, or, but or, I, d- I definitely think that they're saying, "Hey, let's put this in there." By the way, nuance and is really not, I don't believe that happens. You say I do. Really? Yeah, hundred percent. Here, I'll give you a great example. Here's the best example. Have you guys seen this whole thing with uh, Joe Rogan and CNN mm-hmm. that's going on? Yeah, okay. with uh, what's his name? Yeah, so he hammered them, and they went back and doubled down. Yep. Like Don, like Don Lemon is, is that his name? This is yeah, name, Don right? Lemon. Yeah, he keeps saying that uh, ivermectin, the horse dewormer. Okay, this drug has been prescribed to a billion humans, and was prescribed to humans way before animals. And by the way, there's lots of drugs that humans use, and animals use. Yeah, they obviously are painting a specific narrative and Rogan is calling them out and they are losing right now. They're totally losing because he pointed out the obvious. I think that the narrative that they're trying to point is 
you either are anti-vax against all vaccines yep. or you're pro all vaccines. There's way more yeah, nuance. There's no, there's no in between. Yeah, there's no room for nuance for anything. But anymore. you, okay. So I don't, I don't disagree that that's like a, that's a, a, a big narrative that's happening right now. But I also am careful not to put my tin foil hat on and think that every single time I see it, there's like behind the door deals going on, like Netflix going, oh yeah, we're going to pay an extra million because you built that into the storyline. Like you think that's happening? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, here's what I think about Netflix. I think that they had a show. Uh, that basically was soft core child pornography. Not a single fucking person walked out and, and was on strike at Netflix. Everybody was like, yeah, it's cool. Dave Chappelle, a comedian, goes up there and says some jokes that are offensive because he's a comedian. And people staged walkouts and strikes. Yep. So you tell me. Yeah, but again, that's isn't that that's in, that's the people working for the And company. they have a narrative. Absolutely. And, and their opinions, will, just like any company. I definitely think that. I'm not I'm not necessarily saying that there's like some emperor, you know, behind the curtain that's pulling all the strings. Yeah. But when you have an, a, a company like that, of there's course certain ideas gonna... that are getting preference, you yeah, know, in dude. terms of like priorities like in the forefront versus others that they're trying to kind of like omit. Now, you don't think that's a, a bias of us because we have an opposing view and so it seems like everything flies in the face Bro, of that. I don't care it. what my bias is. It's so clear. I it's watch silly. both sides though. That's the thing. I it's, try to do that. It's so clear. It's obvious. You know what it reminds me of? What was that, uh, that series that we watched that showed all those crazy sports scandals? Uh, remember the one we saw with Bad the- sport? Bad sport. Oh, bad sport with the referees. Okay, they were showing, um, you know, professional uh, series A. I think it's called Italian soccer. Like one of the most, the wealthiest, most successful yeah. uh, leagues in the world, and with some of the most successful teams in the world. And there was this huge scandal of of people influencing referees and picking referees and doing this whole thing. And it was wild and crazy. And it's definitely true and proven. When whenever there's a referee that actively plays a role in the game, there's a huge incentive for that referee to be influenced. That's the bottom line. So it, to say it doesn't happen with corporate media and corporations aren't working in tandem or influenced by government and back and forth is bullshit. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course it is. So and it's I, so obvious. You know, speaking of bad sport, did you like that? I, I mean, I, I know. See, I, this is why Loved I've been, it. you know, I've been trying to get you to watch like 30 for 30s and some of these yeah. things because you'll yeah. enjoy the storyline. You know, they did one. I watched one just like two nights ago. Dude, I had no, this is crazy right here. So there, I forgot what the title. I think it's called Horse Killer or something like that. And there was this dude hmm. who was known for killing racehorses for the rich because, and this, this is how bad this is, right? Is so, it their insurance policy or something? Yes. Oh, my God. So these horses, now here's the dirty part about this that, that blew my mind. They're doing it to, to change $30,000 gaps. Like it's not like a it's not like it's not like it's a million dollar horse and you and you have that horse killed and you cash out on a million. It's like you get a horse, you get you buy this race horse and it's a two hundred fifty thousand, one hundred fifty. So it sound, sounded like most of them were somewhere between one hundred fifty and two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Maybe you could sell the two hundred fifty thousand dollar horse for one ninety at the time, but he's he's dead. He's worth two fifty, and they have found ways to to kill the horse through uh, uh, electrocuting him without it coming up on the autopsy as oh, a, a form of murder. God. It looks like a like a, a, a some sort of a, a stomach disease, the way it current this the stomach turns. Like, a, like something else that's common. Yeah, something wow. else that's very common in horses. And it's such it's such a common practice that this guy did this for years and years for people. And I you know who knows if there's other people that have done it for him, but they would literally do it to close the gap on like twenty or thirty grand. I was like, oh my God, that's so terrible. They're probably like racehorse We've already studied it out, and we've got the genetics. Now kill this one. We'll make a little. Well, bit they of money. Do, if it doesn't pan out, they, you buy this quarter million horse, and then the first three races, they can really tell. Oh, he's either got it or he doesn't have it. And if he doesn't have it, and you've already taken the insurance policy out, and he's worth quarter million, he's worth more Dude. dead to you than he is alive. He's not going to go win races. The, the longer he races, the resale value is going to go down on him. So you either got to sell it right now at a discounted rate. Or they kill him, and he's worth that. I Dude, thought, man, speaking, that's so fucking awful. Speaking of which, with animals, you guys are seeing the news coming out with oh my God. Dr. Fauci. Fauci. Oh, my the God. The dogs. Oh, dude. Of all the shit, by the way, that this Where guy- Where are the protests? Do you know I have a, na all, you have, you know, you have a neighbor that still has a sign in their front yard that says, we I, we believe in Fauci? What, how weird did they like, pull why, this why do you turn people like this or no excuse me it says, I, we trust Fauci is what it says why? we trust Fauci he's a human well yeah but he's why like would you again this, this is a belief system now 
You're not going to critically go through empirical data and, and news, like brand new news that comes out that like undermines like everything. He's That's such a about. powerful state. I don't trust anybody that I don't know. Yeah. Like if you don't know someone personally, why would you ever come out? Forget Fauci, anybody. Just anybody. Like you, someone it says. It makes no sense. To say that. Okay. Yeah, I could say, I might say, how I like dark this is, person. Okay. Like I'm okay with that. You asked me about this guy. That yeah, I, I admire them. Yeah, or, we'll, yeah. What do you we'll think about so-and-so? Well, I yeah. like him. He seems cool, this yeah. or that. But I would never go, I trust him. Okay, well, explain, <laughs> exp know him. explain this uh, study that, that he conducted. Well, so first off, I find it interesting that of all the things that he's been tied to, like uh, you know the, the way that they've gotten money for research, the way he worked with- the this, is the one, this is the one that he's getting heat. Well, I mean, people don't like it when you kill puppies, uh, and, and they don't care what side of the aisle yeah, you're, right you're on. Rightfully so. So there was a there was a test where they took beagle puppies and put their heads in cages. And I had, saw the picture. Had dude. like these flies eat them alive. Then they did another study where they took monkeys and they act they burned a part of their brain that would cause them to be terrified. And then they present them with snakes and, and spiders to see how they just very inhumane animal studies. And now he's going to get destroyed over that. Those are those the people. They, people are okay with you other think shit. Are people still like, oh, I got Fauci. Like, no, you know, like, the sign, the sign's still I up in this Fauci. yard. That's wild. Dude. So, I mean, you, that, here's, here's my like, question. We're still brainwashed now. Here, here's the question I have. Do you trust this person to babysit your kid? That's who I trust. Like, I don't, I don't give a fuck who well, they that's are. That's what I mean. Tr trust it. Okay. Saying you like someone or you're interested. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of other words you can choose, but to, to say that you trust someone that you don't even know, that's such a it's wild. wild. Yeah. Why would you that's do that? That's why, uh, I mean, those people who would have their kids spend the night with Michael Jackson and shit all the time. Yeah. I'm like, dude, right. I don't give a shit how great his music is. Yeah. You ain't watching my kid. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't we're know not, you. We're not on that level like, yet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, shit stresses me. Yikes. Hey, you know what? You know what? I'll tell you what. Uh, Listen, speaking of stress. Speaking of stress. <laughs> can I just tell you, I the Ned hemp oil capsules are incredible. They are they feel so good. Yeah. I, I, and they're so easy to take because they're in the capsule. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's funny. We get, a lot of, the audience doesn't know this. We get, Stuff sent to us all the time. Companies are constantly trying to get us to work Especially with Especially CBD stuff. I must have tried, I, I don't know, 50 CBD hemp oil products, and I almost never feel anything. I yeah. take them, and I feel nothing. I Barely feel nothing. like any impact. Nothing. Yeah. Ned, you feel. Take Ned, wait 45 minutes Do you to think hour, that's the full it. spectrum thing? Do you think that's the dosage thing? Do you think that's the, the, the crop it's that they're quality. using? What? I guarantee there's, there's shenanigans yes. uh, in, in the other products. Well, I know there is. But I mean, because it's expensive, dude. We even looked into it a long time ago about yeah. you know extracting that from hemp. It's a really expensive process. Well, and you talk about all, you guys talk about all the time about pixie dusting in the supplement industry. It's, I mean, talk about a, a, a very lucrative one to be pixie dusting right now because yeah. everybody is jumping on the CBD there's bandwagon. Like, so a it's gajillion like of those companies. Now. Real easy to put a, just a little bit of CBD in there and then- Or none. It. And yeah, and because FDA is not regu regulating it, so it's pretty easy to get away with No, that. if you take a good hemp oil product, you should not an hour and a half later think to yourself, I think I feel it. Mm. Maybe. No, you take it an hour and a half later, you should be like, oh, I feel that. Like yeah. I feel a, a, a big difference. If you try Ned, you will feel a big difference. And all these other companies that send us stuff, I almost never feel anything. Now, do you have an order of their products that you you like the most or that you use the most? Like, what's your order with Ned stuff? Because I, I like all their stuff, but there's definitely like ones I use more than. So others. the hemp oil just feels good. So I'll take that just to feel good. Mm -hmm. If I want to, you know, I'm going to hang out with the kids or go to a family function or my energy's low. So that's probably the one I use the most. The Ned Sleep is like my emergency. Oh, I need to get some good because if I take that, it's going to put me out. Anytime I travel, I'm bringing sleep. Yeah, yeah. Mellow, I'll use regularly because yeah. it just I think I need magnesium, and that the the kinds of magnesium they have are quite absorbable. Yeah, and I I don't get like tolerance to it, so I use that one. What about you? Not, well, I'd mellow, dude. Mellow is be, I mean, and it wasn't like that until that product came out. So that's their one of their newer products. Um, but and I think it is because I was deficient. I, I don't think that I was getting enough magnesium, and I, and I think that and I have by the way too. I've tried like other good brands that have magnesium, and it doesn't give me the same feeling as the the Ned does. I don't know if that's liquid versus capsule. I don't know if that's the amount of the dose that's in it or the type of magnesium. It's or the type and the dose. If you take, I used to take um, magnesium citrate or whatever. It's the one that fizzes and. Mm -hmm. 
But basi- you don't absorb it. It basically just acts like a laxative. So if you need a good laxative, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I'm no, sure I'm serious. The, yeah, that does have that property because I remember like trying to pitch that to somebody and they're like, oh, so I could like, you know, shit my pants. I'm like, no, have, no, no, it's not like that. Have you guys stacked the mellow with the sleep before? Yes. You want, <laughs> yes. You want to go down, dude? Yeah, like, if you want to sleep, if I want to bro. sleep like nine hours, then I'll do that. Yeah, I won't do that every night. But right. if it's a night where like I need to get to it's sleep Coming back early, from Vegas or something? Yeah, or like reset, like, oh yeah. my goodness, that yeah. is like, talk about, you know, I mean, I think I wake up sucking my thumb. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, hey, the, or, or drool, drool on my pillow. Like, yeah. whoa, wow. You ever do that? That's you, it. Wake you, up, that was a good one. Bro, yeah. you ever, you ever uh, do that? Yeah. You wake up so, and you look in the mirror and you got like drool crust. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man. Your yeah. skin is just that like was a, baby. That was a good night skin, right there. You know? no, <laughs> yeah. that, that was last night for me, dude. I tell you what, I woke up, bro, and I had like three crazy ass dreams. And the one was Jessica and I, because I watched you. I keep watching you. I so we murdered someone. In the dream, though, we didn't murder the person. I just remember I was in the dream thinking, and I was hanging out with her like, I hope See, nobody I ever finds the body. See, I about that, dude, because like, uh, subconsciously, you're, you know, you just keep taking in like some of these things, these imagery. Like I, I went through that with Walking Dead, and I had to stop because it was like, it, it, it stopped being about the zombies. You know, like, we yeah. got to kill these zombies. It, it became like people just slaughtering people. Oh, my God. You know, and I was just like... Why am I watching this? <laughs> this is affecting me. Yeah. I had a dream too, but it, you know what's weird? That it wasn't gory, scary dream. It was like the planning of it, like that we were going to kill somebody. And it's, it actually didn't feel like a scary dream. So that's what was so weird about watching you because I think they normalize it yeah. so much in there. That it, you know, I it's it's you know, I watch a like a scary movie, which is rare. But if, if I were to watch something like that, like in a, it, another reason why I don't like watch them is it does it'll affect me, and then I'll have a scary dream, wake up like huh, sweating, don't like it. Where <laughs> watching you, you yeah, <laughs> watching you doesn't make me scared, but like it's definitely in there because I have dreams of like that, but it doesn't feel like a scary. Have dream. Have you seen all the memes that people are making with uh, what's her name, Love? The, the girl in there. No, right? no. So she's like the epitome of like the crazy girlfriend yeah. or wife. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, there'll be a, like the meme will say something like, you know, when someone likes your boyfriend's uh, picture on Instagram and it's got a picture of her. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Oh, she's just taking people out. Oh, that's dude. great. So good. Hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying the show. You got to check out one of our partners, Paleo Valley. They have great paleo based supplements. Now, one of my favorites is their grass fed beef sticks. Like this is really delicious stuff. Great macros made from 100% grass fed and grass finished beef. Another product I like a lot is their bone broth protein. Literally the most, the excuse me, the least processed, I should say, protein powder I've ever seen in my entire life. The ingredients literally say bone broth protein, nothing else. So it's really easy to digest. There's no artificial anything, no colors, no sweeteners, no nothing just the protein. Again, super easy to digest. And of course, we all know the qualities and the health benefits of bone broth protein. Go check them out. They have lots of other products. Head over to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump 15. That's mind pump one five for 15% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Lopez 93. What is the exercise you dislike the most but do regularly because you know it's beneficial? Ooh. Oh yeah, uh, you know pull ups. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's a that's actually a good call. Why do you hate them? Uh, I, I just like them was never good at them. You know, I was a pusher. Yeah, more in a puller. Uh, that's not, uh, yeah, but it's true. Um, I don't know. I just there's some innuendo there's there. There's no but, sexual. Um, yeah. There. <laughs> I just remember, you remember the presidential physical fitness tests? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I did really well, like in in the mile run, push up contests, yeah, like the sit the reach, abs, all pull ups. We're just a grind. That kid dude. hanging like this. <laughs> it's because you got that <laughs> dump truck, bro. Uh, it just sucked. And and it's always been that. So I would avoid it. I'd come back to it, avoid it. And now it's just like it's a part of the routine by spite, you know, because I just don't want to be weak. Yeah. You know what? You know what's funny? Uh, with the presidential fitness test, I did, I crushed everything. The one test used to always oh, piss me off was the seat, sit and reach. What a stupid fitness uh, test. Because yeah. <laughs> well, you suck at it. I don't care. It's I, I, I crushed the flexible. run. I crushed the push. All the <laughs> physical stuff. Then you got to sit down and you got to go and reach as far as you well, can. Well, they got to give the Gumby kid something. Yeah, you know? right? 
That's, made me so mad. Uh, <laughs> made me so mad. Today. The irony of that, that's probably your Achilles heel today. If, we, if You're probably the least flexible out of all of us. No, I think flexibility, I'm pretty good. Mobility is different, though. But I got decent flexibility from jujitsu. Mm. But my mobility is not that, not that phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different story. Bro. Yeah. That's a so different story. So what's yours then? Yeah. You know, I would have to say the split stance, lower body exercise. Ooh, Bulgarian split squat like that? Walking lunges, back step uh, yeah, lunges, a... single leg exercises. Oh. They, they're just... I, I can get now. I enjoy them now because I've connected them to the. I've played some mind games on myself uh, with it. I've connected the benefit to the exercise, which uh -huh. now makes me enjoy it. It's like it's what you do with vegetables too. It's like if I sit and like right. think of the taste of the vegetables, I'm like, uh. but if I start to really connect the dots to the benefit, then I start to actually enjoy the vegetables. Split stance exercises, you can't go as heavy. I love heavy training. You know, I like loading up the barbell. I like to feel like I'm you know packing on the muscle. And, you know, when I'm doing those exercises, they just, they're lighter, they require more balance, I need to be slower with them. But I've dedicated myself to them for a little while, and I see the carryover. So now that I've connected them to the benefit, I like them a little more, but I still don't enjoy them as much as like that, a That's squat. such a good point, because I think yeah. that most, there, most exercises that I do on a regular basis, I might have, or I probably hated at one point, yeah. but because I've gone through that process of, okay, regardless of, of me hating it or not, I'm going to build into my routine consistently. And then I've done it long enough that it's shown me the benefits from it that I've learned to like it. I mean, squats was like that for me at one point. Oh, wow. Great point. Yeah, you, I mean, were, you hated squats. I hated uh -huh. squats. That's like one of my favorite things to do. If there's anything, I, if I have a week where I do hardly anything, I will definitely at least squat. So... You know, a lot of movements that I do on a regular basis at one point uh, now, which because, okay, here's the thing. Most people uh, hate the stuff that is most effective and most difficult, right? Most people like pull-ups are pretty hard. You know, squatting is pretty hard. Yeah. Deadlifting is pretty hard. Overhead, pr standing overhead press is hard. You know, they're like, you know, Turkish get up hard. These are all hard movements and they also come with tremendous benefit. And if you've done a good job of, putting it in your routine consistently long enough, it's probably paid you dividends and then you don't have the same feeling about it. So it's hard to say this. Like, it's hard to, like, what is it that I'm doing right now that I'm in there on a regular basis that I that I really hate doing, but I continue to do it really well. I mean, pull-ups are probably the one that comes to mind the, the most, Justin, because I, I do go in and out of these phases when I am doing pull-ups and I just came out of a phase of not doing them for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I suck at them right now. Mm -hmm. So of course, as soon as I see I suck at them, I'm like, okay, I'm going to fix this. I don't want to be that bad at pull-ups. such a functional movement. Yeah. Right? I love pull-ups. one of my favorite exercises. But I think when you – you know what? You guys are bringing up good points because we've been training for so long. Um, I think you got to get past some of that stuff because you see the benefit. You're like, well, this is why I'm doing it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just going to I would doing never it. do a standing – before you guys, I would have never done a standing overhead press on my own. Mm -hmm. It's not something I like to do at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely wasn't even deadlifting yeah. before, really. I would have never done sled, the sled drives. Right. Never. It was. It would. It felt too – like it didn't give me the pump, and it felt like I was like, "What? I'm not going to play football or yeah, whatever." It's just hard and yeah, yeah, and like less reward. But now I do it at least once a week, if not twice a week, because uh, I'm starting to really see and feel the benefits that it's providing. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that's another good point. It, you are going to go through cycles with exercises. Mm -hmm. There's going to be times when you're not going to like an exercise, and then times when you like. Like you know, here's the deal. Certain ways of working out I like when I'm trying to get lean, and there's certain ways of working out that I like to do when I'm trying to build size and bulk. Mm -hmm. Like heavy lifting for low reps and uh, you know long rest periods you sucks be when I'm getting lean yeah. because I'm just not as strong. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go out and squat or deadlift tons of weight when my calories are low. So I tend to pair it with lighter weight and supersets, not because of the calorie burn or anything, but because I already not gonna, I'm already not going to lift as much weight because I'm doing short rest periods. Yeah. Might as well do it when my calories are low, right? Well, that's the same. I mean, I I just got back into like kettlebell swings. I hate it right now because I've just been doing like no cardio, no endurance training, like yeah. nothing like that kind of explosive. And it's, it, it, oh man, and it's very visible and, and my body feels the lack of uh uh, you know, work in that direction. So it's just one of those things like I, I'm like, well, I should probably get back into these just because I haven't done them in so long. I mean, that's the takeaway from this is that no matter what it is that you hate doing, you do it long enough, you're going to see some tremendous benefit from it. And that typically switches you hating it. 
I think at one it's point, true. a lot of the stuff that I do on a regular basis and a lot of the stuff that I love today, I hated at one point. Yeah, no, you know? So if you can discipline yourself to just be consistent, especially if you know it's good for you, right? You know it's a movement. You know it's a one of those movements that has so many benefits to it, and you just have never been really consistent with it for long enough. Stick with it, well, and it'll, it'll probably end up turning into something you love. Here's a little mind game you can because it's all about how you – perceive the movement and what part of it you're focusing on. Like if I'm focusing on, am I good at this exercise now? Then there's going to be exercises that I'm going to hate. If I switch my mindset and fall in love with the improvement of the exercise. Mm -hmm. So not that I'm good or bad at it, but rather, wow, I can see that I'm getting better at And I fall in love with that part of it. Then what ends up happening is these exercises that you suck at start to become your favorite because the potential for improvement is so right. high in them. Right. Like the exercises that I'm already good at now, my potential for improving on them is low. I've been doing them for a long time. I'm already good at them. But if I go do an exercise I suck at, I'm going to get I'm going to see improvements on a weekly basis. And so if I don't focus on the the fact that I suck at it, but rather the improvements, now I start to enjoy doing the exercise. So you have to you have to change your mindset. Yeah, reframe it. Yes. Next question is from Kara M. McLeod. What do you all do during rest times between sets? Yeah. Send nudes to each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's always, it's always it's to each other. Sal does that. I yeah. dance. Yeah. Oh, you're working Flexing around? pictures all the time. You know what's fun? You know why? Check this out, Adam. You know why I picked this question? Because and I, I when I first became a trainer, I remember thinking this was the strangest thing ever. But I trained client. Remember, I, we, I came from a resistance training background, right? That's how I always worked out. And I would train a client, and then we would do a set, and then we'd stop. And they'd be like, okay, what do I do? Well, what do hey, I do now? Now, now what? Now yeah, what do now I do now while what? I'm resting? Can I do something else? And I remember being like, no, you just you just rest. That's the point. Oh, I don't need to rest. You, I know it's not that you don't need to rest, but the rest is what is allowing us to target a specific adaptation. If you don't rest, we're training for stamina and endurance, which is fine if that's what you want. Yeah. But if you want strength, muscle building, you're muddying boosting. the waters if you keep moving. Around. Yeah. So now that being said, so in between sets. You're not trying to exercise or anything, but what I like to do in between sets is read. I like to read uh, interesting articles or I like to write. So sometimes my workouts will spark interesting thought for me. And since I work out before the podcast, I'll take notes. Oh, you know what? There's this thing about this, about this exercise I want to talk about. Or, oh yeah, I got that message from that person about that particular supplement and I'll write notes. And that is a really cool feeling to be productive in between sets that way. But I, I think the key is it really doesn't matter so long as you rest, so long as you don't, you're not getting your body tired. In well, between I think sets. it, I think it matters. I think it matters quite a bit actually, but I think it, what matters most is what your desired outcome is from the workout. Right. So there's times when, um, I'm training for more for the mental aspect and just of the consistency of being healthy that I am uh, than making progress in the mm -hmm. gym. Mm -hmm. So like there's like d there's definitely two very clear differences of like how my mentality going into the workout. If if I'm on a kick like I just, you know, okay, I'm prepping my food right now, I'm going to make some serious body fat change or strength gains. I actually want my music in my ears. I don't want any distractions. I don't want my phone nearby me and between resting periods I'm actually focusing on my breathing. I'm just calming my heart rate down, already thinking about my next set and how much weight I'm about to grab and kind of keeping an eye on the clock to see where my timing is. And then boom, I'm in it. Like oh, it's you're like you're focused. I'm so, so focused sure. on the lift and what I'm doing. And it's all about optimizing that. So I'm calming my, my brain. I'm, I'm bringing my breathing down, making sure I'm getting really good rest before I get into the next one. And then prepping myself, getting psyched to go in like that's like, you know, training Adam. I'm focused on making moves uh, with my physique. Then there's, you know, other times where I'm probably more like this right now where, you know, I'm about optimizing my life and I'm about what's going on in our business. And so I'm multitasking. So I might be texting to, you know, Katrina, something that's going on or one of you guys business stuff. I might be reading an article in between yeah. my rest period may not be exactly right at 90 seconds. Cause I might be right in the middle of saying something at the 90 second mark and it might go to two minutes or whatever. So, and I don't think that there's necessarily something wrong with that so long as that your desired outcome at the time isn't so focused around progress. Like mm -hmm. it's okay to go work out and it's not always about, I got to add, 
you know, two more pounds of muscle or I got to burn three more pounds of fat. Sometimes it's just, it's part of my routine of being a healthy, a healthy fit dad. And I can multitask and do that. Mm -hmm. But so it really matters what your desired outcome is going into it, in my opinion. Yeah. I have a very similar way I approach uh, rest with that in terms of like what I'm actually trying to, to accomplish and the intent of it. So if it is performance driven, you know, in between is just that meditative empty mind. So it's really, for me, it's just trying to stay as present as I can and like not think about anything else going on. And it's, it's something I have to be disciplined with, um, as I'm, as I'm sitting there, or as I'm just slowly walking around and keeping my heart rate calm, uh, it, it's just trying to focus on, I try and focus on my heart rate. I try and focus on my breathing. I try to then, you know, stare at one thing and just like, you know, let my mind just completely empty all thought. And then I go right back in, uh, you know, and, and then accomplish my next set. But other than that, it's like, you know, sometimes it's restorative. I'm just trying to like, just chill in between, or sometimes I'm trying to be creative, uh, you know, and, and so a lot of like cool ideas come to me, like to Sal's point, like I'll, I'll write them down. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in that sort of mindset, sometimes it's there's social, you know, components. If I'm not taking the actual time in the gym as seriously in terms of, you know, trying to, to, to move the needle forward, it's just more of a maintenance kind of a, a, a phase for me. So it just really depends on what that intent is going into the gym. Yeah. Another example that, cause I get people that ask a lot of questions about the, especially right now, the squat and scrolls going all over the place. Right. Um, you know, there was a time and a phase when I was really trying to make progress in that. Like I was trying to get to a place where I was comfortable in this really deep squat. And so rest period, I could be doing dumbbell bench press and then I'd hop down on the ground and I'd, you know, get in that, you know, and I'd work, I'd work down in that real deep position and subtle flex there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, but it really though, that's, uh, at that time, uh, it was more important to me to get, uh, get better hip and ankle mobility than it was to increase my bench press. Yeah. Uh -huh. So even though I'm in a, a, the middle of a bench press set, you know, I'm getting ready to do my dumbbell press. I'm so focused right now on my hip and ankle mobility right. that I'm hopping down for that 90 seconds and I'm, and I'm working on my hip and ankle mobility. So you know, there's, there's not like this rule of what you it just, but you have to know what is your main goal right now. Yeah. And, and you guys said like, we would never do like cardio. Into. Well, that's not necessarily true. If my, uh, if my, if I really cared about just increasing my capac my work capacity and, and my stamina, I cared about that at the time more than I even cared about building my chest or building well, more sure. muscle. You might, you might actually do jumping jacks or something ridiculous in between sets. Most people, when their goal is fat loss or building muscle, that's probably going to be counterproductive. But if you cared more about building stamina than you cared about building muscle or burning fat, well, then it wouldn't be that bad of an idea mm -hmm. to do things that are active when you're actually supposed to be resting. So it really depends on the mindset going into yeah. the, the programming when you do stuff like I'm that. I'm yet to try Paul Check's method. I think it's like really interesting where he paints in between yeah. and, you know, has like that artistic side of the brain kind of take over, uh, you know, during the rest periods and then transitions back, uh, you know, to getting after it. That's kind of what Sal's doing. Yeah. yeah. When you think about it, when Sal's yeah. reading and then actually writing yep. content, I mean, you're I using like a it. different side of the brain to do that. Yeah, because the majority of my the benefit I get now from exercise is mental. It's my it's the mental aspect of it that I do it mainly. And so, but that's, I want to see you paint. Is the yeah, point? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next question is from Anil P Fitness. White rice versus brown rice. Is there I'm really so, a difference? So glad you brought this yeah. up because this why this gets asked a million times. Yeah. So okay, uh, brown rice is a whole grain. It's got the the you know the germ over it and the 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 hole or whatever. That makes rice uh, difficult to chew or, okay, does that make it healthier? No. In fact, it reduces its bioavailability and increases the odds at which it's going to cause potential gut issues. So this is where what we've learned through mainstream, you know, baloney, you know, health and fitness advice is totally wrong. Yes, on paper, it's got more, more fiber and whatever, therefore it should be better. No. Just like a rock is full of minerals, but if you eat a rock, it's not going to improve your health. Brown rice actually is harder to digest, can cause more issues and cause more potential gut issues. And 
there are things in brown rice called anti nutrients yeah, that I was actually say, reduce. Doesn't it strip you of uh, nutrients? Yeah, it can too? actually reduce the 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 absorbability of certain nutrients. White rice is a far better. Now people think, well, what, we got to take something off of food to make it healthier. Yeah, okay. We just did, we did a recent podcast where we talked about how vegetables and plants have you know certain components in them to make them more difficult to digest as a defense mechanism. This is what the carnivore advocates talk about all the time. They say that, oh, plants have defense mechanisms, therefore they're bad for you, which they go too far with that. Yes, there are defense mechanisms in plants, but that's why we process them and we cook them. And one of the things that we discovered as humans is that if you just eat the white rice and you boil it, it's very, white rice is very easy to digest. It's one of the it's one of the foods that is really low on the scale of potential food intolerances. It's a great source of starchy carbohydrates. You try to eat the same amount of rice and make it brown, and a lot of people have gut issues from it or start to notice problems. So the difference between the two in, in terms of application, white rice is eat, eat much easier to digest and probably better for you from a nutrient perspective in the sense that it, it doesn't reduce your absorb, uh, absorbability of certain nutrients. Not to mention, it tastes way better. And it tastes way better. And if you flip the back or over and you look at the macros, it's like you're almost splitting identical. hairs. Yeah, yeah it's all, they're almost identical what you're, what you're getting from a, a nutrient level, and it tastes better. I remember when I first learned that a long time ago. I never looked back. I used to be a brown... I remember in my early yeah. 20s, I thought brown rice was healthier, and so... I was eating brown rice with everything and, you know, chewing it down, going like, this tastes like shit, eating it. Found that out and was like, oh my, I never looked back. I never again did brown rice. I think it's ridiculous. Like, so unless you're some weird person who actually thinks that brown rice tastes better, then if that's the mm. case, then by all means. But it's, you're splitting hairs, the difference. But you still see it like uh, Chipotle or one of these, like, you know, restaurant chains will will all of a sudden promote like, the consumer. brown rice versus white rice, and it's 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 just still something that's out there that's uh, portrayed as like the healthier option. You know, it's like that too. Uh, sweet potato French fries versus regular French fries. <laughs> you think that you're getting this as healthier I'm, thing? I'm doing, good. but they're both deep yeah. fried. And when you actually look at the the macro difference on yeah. it, the fries will actually be a little bit lower lower calorie. Yeah. One so, thing that I noticed, but you, was, there's this. You know, we know sweet potatoes healthy, yes. so you just you think that oh, this I, is a better sweet choice. Sweet potatoes. For for me personally, easier to digest, believe it or not. Yeah. White, white potato can sometimes yeah. cause uh, a little bit of gut issues. Yeah, so it's phytic acid is what it's called in brown rice that um, that reduces the absorption of certain vitamins and minerals. And, and in fact, in some in third world countries, by the way, they don't eat brown rice. They eat white rice because they find in a lot of third world countries, obviously their food intake is low and challenged and they don't have lots of variety. And they find when they eat lots of brown rice – that the children would develop uh, nutrient deficiencies. And it wasn't until they switched to white rice that they solved this issue. So um, now that being said, again, if you know if you like brown rice, that's fine. Go for it. But if you're thinking that it's this healthier option, it's not. Uh, white rice is, for most people, probably better. Next question is from Billy B3. How much sugar a day is too much? Anything over 27.25. <laughs> you know what's funny about this? Actually, that's it, close to a number I used to try and keep my clients yeah, under. 25 was the number I was It depends to. on the person, but I, I will say this. Here's what the studies will actually show. The, the amount of sugar that you eat doesn't really matter as much as if you, it, when your calories are low, especially yeah. if you're in a deficit. Yeah. If you're in a deficit, sugar doesn't have like this crazy negative effect. It's when you're in this calorie surplus that you start to see problems with lots of sugar. Now, that being said, I will say this. Sugar, in my experience with clients, does stimulate the appetite in a particular, in a, in a very interesting way. So if I have a client that's like, hey, I read the studies. It's funny because Lane likes to, to actually counter that argument all the he time. He does, and, but my experience is not like that. Now, I know it's usually sugar in combination with fat that causes the, the, you know, the palatability and all that stuff. But in my experience, I've had clients who've done this. They're like, hey, look, these were, these were like doctors who read the studies. I'm like, Sal, in this study, it showed that high sugar, low calorie, blood markers improved. There was no difference between that and a, a diet that was low in sugar. And I said, okay, give it a shot and let me know how you feel. And sure enough, they came back and they're like, yeah, my appetite is all over the place. And it's harder for me to eat lower calories than when I eat more complex carbohydrates and more fats and proteins. So that's the one thing I will say, but you know, sugar in a high calorie, in the context of a high calorie diet 
can have some pretty inflammatory effects uh, in, in a lot of people and cause maybe potential issues with insulin uh, resistance. Do you guys have any experience? My, ex my experience with my clients with this is that if I'm, if I'm um, coaching a competitor who's weighing and measuring and tracking their food, um, so long as we stay within their parameters and the, the guidelines I give them, then allowing them to have sugar in the diet is no big deal. Uh, so long as they're following their parameters and they're, yeah. and they're sticking to that. If I am trying to teach a client to kind of intuitive eat, intuitively eat or just change some behaviors, one of the first go-to things I do is actually cut back almost all sugar intake. Because I find that when I don't do that, clients do tend to yeah. overeat. What 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 the mechanism that does that? I can't tell you. I can't mm -hmm. tell you exactly what's happening that causes people to do that. It's just I've experienced that with so it's many clients thing. and myself enough times yeah. mm -hmm. that I just like if I allow a little bit of sugar in my in my diet, will it be just like oh, I decide? Let's say. Um, you know, yesterday I was moving around a lot and I could totally afford to have that, you know, 300 calories of, of Sour Patch candy. And I haven't had something like that in yeah. forever. And I have that. Something that I can guarantee happens is that night, all of a sudden, I want ice cream. Or the next day, all of a sudden, I want a soda. Like, it... I, my cravings change. The minute I introduce it into into my diet, now I start to crave that. And it just and it doesn't mean that I can't. It doesn't mean I can't get buff still or get shredded and still insert those things in the diet. It just makes it harder for me. It's yeah. like now I have this other thing that I have to do. It's already hard enough mm -hmm. to restrict calories and stay in this this calorie intake and exercise on a regular basis. Oh, now when I allow sugar to occasionally come in there, now I'm also battling this craving thing that I know. Versus when I eliminate it and I. I stick to all whole foods and I don't have any the only sugar I'm getting is from from natural sources like fruit whole fruit yes not fruit juice that's right it's just yeah. when I, if I'm only getting there I don't battle these things mm -hmm. yeah. and the moment that I allow it in there even if my calories are low and it's not going to affect me and put fat on my body now I'm battling that craving yep. again and so for me that's enough to coach clients when I'm teaching them hey let's if that's not something you have to have in the diet let's get rid of that shit mm -hmm. yeah for me I mean it's it's just a behavior thing. It's it's something that, you know, evolutionarily we've been hardwired to be rewarded. Like that that signal is is a massive loud signal of reward. And it's it's like, you know, once you introduce that signal, uh, you know, it's just a natural response of like wanting to introduce that back and like keep that into the routine uh, because it's it's something that just hardwired wise, like it's, we're going to be fighting that a lot, that, that response. And so it's, it's a very strong, uh, a signal. And, and, and regardless of this, like this nuanced talk that, you know, a lot of people get in this debate on whether or not it's bad for you or it's toxic or it, you know, it, it, it leads to all these diseases, whatever, all that stuff, like granted, like calories are a big you know, proponent of this is in terms of like it having more weight, uh, you know, if, if you're over your calorie limit and, and having sugar in there, it's probably more, you know, of a problem than, you know, if you're under calories and, and, and it's in there. But at the end of the day, behaviorally, like this is just something that you're just going to continually fight and it could, you know, like take over a majority of what you're consuming. The other thing, it, ch it changes the way fruits and vegetables taste for me. That's the other thing I don't like about it. So if I allow, let's say I always kept my calories under my, you know, my maintenance. Um, so I'm losing body fat, but I, every day I eat Sour Patch Kids in there. My apple and my vegetables taste different. They do not have the same taste as if I were to have no added sugar into my diet and then I eat those things. So part of why I don't like it either was I remember the first time that I cut sugar out for an extended period of time and then actually bit into an apple you know, or had some asparagus like that. The food, the food actually tastes richer to me when I'm not adding any sugar. If I'm letting sugar in the diet on a regular basis, it changes m my palate. Yeah, that the sweet, the perception of sweet is very powerful, and it it can definitely you definitely build a tolerance to it, don't you? Um, and it, it, everybody experiences this again. If you eat lots of sugar, you'll find that sweet. In fact. Uh, artificial sweeteners are several hundred or thousands of times sweeter than sugar. And I've worked with enough clients who have had lots of artificial sweeteners and prefer the flavor of them to sugar because it's actually sweeter. I've actually yeah. had people tell me that. When they drink a soda mm -hmm. with sugar, it doesn't taste as good as the Diet Coke. 
And I think it has to do with, my personal opinion is it has to do with that perception of, uh, of sweetness. I mean, evolutionarily speaking, Justin, you know, sugar in its natural forms was probably pretty rare. Okay. So finding lots of fruit, not that you actually planted and I'm talking about before agriculture, when for most of the time humans were on earth, pretty rare that you'd walk around and find a apple growing or some berries. And by the way, the apples and berries and fruit that we have today has been modified mm. and bred to be much higher in sugar. Apples were full of seeds. There was very More little bitter. meat. You know, yeah. strawberries looked very Half different. Half the size too, by the way. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it weren't nearly as sweet. We, I mean, carrots, near, not nearly as sweet. Like everything was not nearly as sweet. So it was one of those things that was we just didn't get a lot of. I mean, honey maybe, but honey, you had to go kill, like battle a bunch of bees <laughs> in order to get to it. And yeah. if you look at, you know, modern hunter-gatherers, it's a big deal to get honey. It's just not something you see quite common, and but it's but it's a very quick source of energy. So it makes sense that it would trigger these behaviors in us or, or these feelings that we we're going to go seek it out because it's a very you know quick source uh, of energy. So that's that's for me. I see that it changes people's behaviors, but the studies do show that all the negative effects that come from sugar, if your calories are low and you're getting adequate protein and fat, not nearly as big of a difference. When your calories are high, though, high sugar plus high calorie yeah, it's problematic. That starts to look like it causes uh, lots of problems. And the people I find that are most staunch about defending sugar ha are addicted to it. That's I <laughs> swear to God. Yeah, it's like you. Or they have products they're trying to sell that have a lot. Dude, of sugar. When, like when I see, I like, Lane always talks about this stuff, right? So he he's he defends sugar a lot because of how many people have demonized it, right? Which I'm not pro that either, right? I'm not pro demonizing sugar either, but it, uh, making people aware of its uh, addictive properties or how it could change the cravings or change your palate. I think it's very important. And the people that get behind them, like, yeah, fuck those guys. And then you click on their thing and there's like videos yeah. of them doing Sour Patch Kids. Yeah. Donuts yeah. and deadlifts. And, like, yeah, dude, yeah. you're so funny. You, you know, it. or donuts every single day. It's like you, people want to, it's like the whole squatting thing, like telling people not to squat. I hate that. I don't like that messaging. And I remember when we first met Lane, that was one of the things that we would challenge yeah. him a lot on is that it's not that I think he's wrong. I actually, he's right. What he's saying is right. But I also come from the place of training a lot of peop regular people yeah. that are trying to create better behaviors in their life. And could you do it with having sugar, added sugar and candy every once in a while? Absolutely. Is it going to be more difficult? Fuck yes, it will be. Yeah. Yeah, usually the people who eat a lot of sugar are not getting it from whole fruit, are they? Yeah. They're getting it from, from yeah. other things. And I tell you what, it definitely feels different to eat 70 grams of processed sugar in candy or in a soda than having a you know starch seventy grams of starchy carbohydrates, it feels different on the body. I think most people would agree with that. It gives you totally different feeling. Yeah. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We have guides for fat loss and muscle building. We have exercise specific guides and much more. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal, and Adam is at mindpumpadam.